here for my train layout. Yes. What? What happened to my package? It was just here a second ago. I think I just got hit by a porch pirate. Junior, what's this box sitting here? Is this something for you? No, Pa, I didn't order anything. What's the name say? It says, Kerwin T. Slippers. Did my package show up, Daryl? Said it was delivered. Yeah, it's right here. And why are you having stuff sent here? This isn't no up shipping center. I know, Terrell, but I'm scared. I got hit by porch pirates last week. It's still my water tower, Terrell. My water tower. Oh no, not your water tower. Don't think you're gonna be having all your crap sent here. Oh, come on, Terrell, just think. What if they would've got mother's golden buffalo nickels? You can't just reorder those. There's a limit five per customer. Well, what's in this box? Oh, that one? That's my vintage mini bike engine. Oh, really? Well, let's see what you got here, Slipper. <laughs> what the heck is this? They said it was all ready to go. Complete engine. Yeah, looks like you're gonna have to put it together, Slippers. <laughs> uh, yeah. Me. Do you think you could do it for me, Joe? Uh, no. Not after that trick you pulled with the salsa. Oh, come on. You must have got a bad batch. Everybody loves mother salsa. Well, if you want me to put this together, Slippers, you're gonna have to pay me with real money up front. Oh, come on, Terrell. You know I'm good for it. How much you want? I want 200, and that's just to get started. Fine. Thanks, Slippers. Yeah, I'll rebuild that engine. Hi, Ben. And your twin brother. <laughs> Pterodactyl here. Today's how-to video is going to be on this here. Tecumish HS40. This is a HS40. HS stands for Horizontal Shaft Four Horse Engine 40. So if you had a HS50, it'd be a five horse. HX60. They got HH, they got a bunch of different V. If it's a V, it's vertical. So H is horizontal. And this is an old vintage motor that Slippers got that has points and condensers. And it also has this lighting coil because this was on a mini bike. And I'm going to show you how to time it. See, this timing is slotted. So there is a procedure to time it after you put new points and condenser in it to get it exact timing on it. So in any kind of rebuild, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is tear the engine completely down and inspect all the parts. You gotta inspect everything. I don't know how many times people bring me motors and they're like, Oh, oh, my buddy rebuilt this motor. Oh yeah, well what'd your buddy do to it? Did he do a valve job? Well, I, I don't know. Did he, did he replace the ring? Well, I don't know. Well, well, then how come you paid your buddy to rebuild the motor? You don't even know what he did. So you have to disassemble the motor and then you're gonna inspect all the parts. Then you're gonna figure out what parts you need and then you're gonna buy them all, which is what we did. So we went and got all the parts we need. They're all here, the rings, the gaskets, I went ahead and figured out what we needed and got everything. We're gonna start with the crankshaft. Got the crankshaft out and we're inspecting the journals to see if there's any scoring or any wear. And we're, we're inspecting the uh, where the connecting rod goes on this journal to see if there's any wear. And this one looks pretty good. If there was wear, then you would have to opt to get an oversized rod and take this somewhere to have it machined down so the oversized rod would fit on there. But this one looks pretty good. It looks like a 
a little bit of wear there. So if you're gonna polish something like this, you wanna polish it real fine and smooth. You don't wanna take sandpaper to it. If anything, crocus cloth or the finest sandpaper you can get for like sanding on a car, which I think is like 3,000 or 2,000 or something. But you gotta be careful because you can egg shape this and if you egg shape it, it's gonna, it's gonna knock. So this one looks like very minimal polishing. So I got some crocus cloth, which you can't get anymore, and I got some somewhere. We're gonna polish that up a little bit. Then you're gonna inspect the bore, where the piston goes up and down. Now in my other video I did on the five fours, Briggs and Scranton, that we rebuilt, somebody brought up a good point that I overlooked, and that was ridge ream in this. Now if you got a motor that's war, the rings wore it because the rings don't come all the way to the top. So sometimes this little lip here, you're gonna have a ridge from the rings wearing into it and you can't get the piston out. So they got a tool called a ridge ring where you put in there and you spin it around and it cuts that ridge off. But you know what, if you're doing this yourself, you're not gonna go and buy a ridge reamer. And if you got a ridge reamer, you already know how to do all this and you're not even watching this video. You're doing something else, like rebuilding an engine. So what you could do is sand it out. You can probably get a barrel sander, which is inexpensive, which has sandpaper on it, these little barrels. And you could very carefully get that ridge out of there. Take the piston down, get that ridge out, then you can get the piston out. Because what happens is the rings get caught on that ridge and you can't get the piston out when you're disassembling it. You're not gonna hurt nothing by doing that, by sanding it and not using a ridge reamer because the piston don't come up that far anyway. So it doesn't matter. Inspect your valves. Look at the face of your valves. See if they're burnt. These look pretty good. Actually, this motor looks pretty good. Now, back in my day, we didn't have inner screen. You know what our inner screen was? This, a book, a manual you would go and get that has the uh, information in it. See, it looks like a cartoon book, like a comic book. And you would read this and follow along. But it seems like nowadays people can't read. Well, they can read, they just can't comprehend what they're reading. Well, I just read that whole paragraph and I don't know, know what it means. So on this page here, this is that ignition timing procedure I was telling you about. Here's another old manual. This was our inner screen. Mechanics manual, you'd have to get this somewhere or buy one. Oh, look at here, this page I'm on, look. There's a guy with a pry bar and a knockoff tool and a hammer taking the flywheel off. Oh, I don't know how many times people would say, you're gonna ruin that engine, Charles, taking that off. And look, the guy's doing it right in here. Uh, yeah, they showed you how to do it, knucklehead. That ain't how you take it off. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I don't forgot. When you're looking up your parts, you gotta find your parts, you gotta find your model number. So you gotta have your model type, spec numbers, so you can find the proper parts for your motor. So you gotta do that too. This one's got some pretty heavy paint on it, but it does say HS40 on there. So if you wanna get a manual find all the specs for all the journals and everything, then you're gonna have to have some kind of measuring tool to measure all that to make sure it's within specs. You can go on the inner screen and buy a caliper, Vernier caliper, for pretty cheap. This is a pretty good one. I checked it against my other one when I bought it. This was like 10 or $11 on eBay, you know, my favorite store. So you can buy one of these. 
and I checked it against the one I had and it was pretty accurate within a thousandth of an inch so that's pretty close Beep. so next thing we're gonna do is you're gonna clean all your parts you want to get all your parts nice and clean now obviously this motor is all clean already but if yours is all dirty and oily and nasty you're gonna want to clean everything you're going to want to get all the oil and residue and everything off. So on this motor, we're going to do new seals. We want to put new seals in, new head gasket, new sump gasket. You're going to want to get all those parts. But this is a pretty simple motor. No matter what motor you're doing, this is the procedure you do it on. It doesn't matter if it's a single cylinder horizontal shaft or if it's a single cylinder vertical or a twin cylinder they all work the same way piston goes up and down valves go up and down and we'll clean this out a little better see this is still a little dirty so we'll clean all this out oh another thing clean off all the old gasket material I'm using a single edge razor blade works good if you don't have a scraper because remember, this is a how-to channel. This is for the guy, our channel is for the guy that doesn't have all the fancy tools. Because if he had all the fancy tools, again, he wouldn't be watching this video. He would already know how to do this. Unless he's watching for the entertainment. <laughs> so yeah, let's get all the gasket material cleaned off real good. Make sure there's no high spots. I can feel like a little lip on there right on the edge you can file that off you know you don't want to file this way you just want to kind of file at an angle get that little ridge off of there and we want to do all that before we go cleaning it because then you're just going to scrape gasket material on your clean block and then have to clean it again and we'll take this valve cover off going to replace that gasket. You want to replace all the gaskets, so you might as well just get a gasket kit. But luckily I looked in my stock and I had everything in stock, just about. There were a couple things I had to order that were missing on here. But I had uh, I had all the gaskets. I didn't have a gasket kit. I had them all individual. I had all the seals. The governor uh, arm that goes on here, that was missing. I had to order that. And a couple of little clips and stuff that hold this governor spool on here was missing. And then on your cover, you're going to want to make sure that's all clean. That's very important. You don't want it to leak. So just kind of feel around with your hand. Make sure there's no, you know, nothing rising up on there. And scrape it this way with the razor blade. Razor blade works kind of good. Some of them big uh, gasket scrapers, they kind of gouge the metal, like the one I got here. Let me grab it real quick. I mean, this one works good sometimes on different jobs, but a lot of times it like gouges the metal. So a razor blade works good. That way you're not taking off a lot of aluminum alut or aluminium as they say over there to my friends in England. Hello friends in England and Australia. Good day mate. <laughs> Tally ho. And all that kind of rubbish. Over here we call it garbage. Over there you call it rubbish. And I want to get down in here. I noticed this is kind of dirty in here. Clean all them pockets. Look at all that nastiness in there. All them boogers. And then there's a lot of oil and crap gets in where the... Look at that. That's some gasket paper. Right where these drain plugs are. So you want to take them drain plugs out. And make sure that's all clean nastiness accumulates in there 
So we want to get everything nice and clean. Now, on this Tecumish gasket that goes on here, you usually got to pop this thing apart to put that gasket on and then you put this back together. So if you get in there with a little screwdriver, you can pop this apart like so. And then you can clean all this. See all that nastiness in there? Got that little flapper valve. So we're gonna clean all that out. Make that nice and purdy. Yeah, see there's some leftover gasket because they, they didn't pop this apart to take the gasket off. They just kind of fried the gasket off. So remember that on the Tecumish, you gotta pop this apart. And this will only go on one way. Can't put it on it wrong. It won't fit. So it goes on one way. So we're gonna have to clean that up all nice and purdy. So that's very important. Clean all your parts. So mic everything, check everything, make sure it's all within your specifications. If you have to have it bored, have it bored, get oversized rings before you go ordering stuff. You can check. Do a little check by taking one of the rings off and sticking it in the bore, looking at your end gap. You see how much your rings are wore. And you wanna kinda of push it down a little bit in there. Cause the bore is kinda of like tapered, you know? It's kinda, of, it's not straight bored, it's kinda of got a little taper to it. So you can push your ring down in there, check your end gap. So we're not going to bore this motor, we're just going to hone it a little bit and put a new set of rings in there, standard rings. So let's grab a new ring and stick it in there and see what kind of gap we got now. And look, look, we got a tight gap compared to this ring we just had in there. So this is a good bore on this motor. See how that is, nice and tight. Now I'm gonna pop it out and I'm gonna pop this one back in there. And you'll see. See, that's got a pretty good size gap in there. Doesn't mean that these rings would have made it smoke. But since we're gonna rebuild it, we're gonna put new ones in there. And if you had your caliper, you know, you'd be able to measure your bore. This thing comes in handy for all kinds of stuff. So for 10 bucks, you know, you might as well buy one. I mean, you can't get down in the bore to measure it, but at least you can measure a little bit in there. Two inches, 612 and a half thousandths. Let's zero it, try it again. Two inches, 621 and a half thousandths. Now that's pretty close if you check in the book to see what it says. You should do like a bore indicator, a bore gauge. See, we went back to zero. So 261 and a half. I'm sure that was right. Let me turn it off. Beep. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and hone it. Scratch it up a little bit with my hone. And then I'll go back in and uh, wash it real good and clean it real good. All right, I'm, I'm disassembling more parts off the block before I start to hone it. I took the ignition off and I'm gonna pop this seal out. So pay close attention to the seal and how it's in there. Cause you don't wanna go popping the seal out and then you go put a new one in and you go, well, how, how deep was it in there? Cause you got an oil hole down in there. You drive the seal in too far, you kind of block that hole, which is gonna keep 
the oil from getting to that journal and draining back into the block. So if you notice, this one's sticking out just a little bit. So we'll have to remember that when we go to put the new seal in. There's the seal, whoa, that was fun. And then that way when we're cleaning it, we make sure we get all this nastiness out of there too. So we got our hone. This is the hone I'm gonna use. The hone I like to use, and I should have bought one, but I didn't. I was gonna buy one before we did this video, but I'm so busy I forgot. Are those ones with the little balls on it. Those work the best. Those give you the, a real good crosshatch than these uh, stone home. Now this one's adjustable. You can adjust the tension on that spring, which, you know, more tension on that spring, then harder it's gonna push on the wall. So I got this thing loosened up as far as it'll go. Chances are you don't have a, a wash tank at your house, so you're gonna wanna spray some kind of lubricant on there, you know, to keep that going as you're honing it. So you could use WD-40, or you can use any kind of lubricant. You don't wanna use that gel lube we sell, because that's a different kind of lubricant. You wanna use something that's watery. So WD-40 works good, and I know a lot of people have that. But we're gonna do ours in my wash tank. So everybody's got a cordless drill, I would think. So you want to go nice and slow, and you want to go up and down. Now we don't have to do this much because this board's pretty good. We just want to stuff it up a little bit. Not like that five horse bridge video I did. That one, that board was pretty bad. So you are going to invest a little bit of money if you're going to do a rebuild. You know, you're going to have to buy a hone, you're going to have to buy a dial indicator, veneer caliper. So yeah, see that little bit I did? You can see where I missed a few spots right here on this side. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a few little spots. You'll see when you do yours. And I know you're thinking, well, Terrell, if you like the ball hone so much, how come you don't have a ball hone? Well, my brother Farrell had the ball hone at his place. And nowadays, we don't do a lot of rebuilds because it's so costly and they make everything so cheap. So I just got the good old fashioned stone home. And it works good for what I'm doing. But yeah, I'll get one. I'll get one of those ball homes. So now I'm gonna go ahead and wash this up real good since I got it all apart. Now there's all kinds of little household products that we use every day that you could use in a little small engine rebuilding. And one of them is a Q-tip. Q-tip works good for getting in these little nooks and crannies. I know we got Q-tips. And for remember I told you about this? Here, here's the clean end. Well, let me get a clean one. Remember I was telling you about where the oil drain plug goes? Even though I washed it with solvent, Look. Your ears are dirty, aren't they? You got dirty ears, don't you, little boy? Yeah. Oh, look at all the dirt in your ears, little boy. See? All that nastiness in this little guy's ears? That all accumulated over time. And you'd think, oh, I washed it out real good with that solvent. No, you didn't, because look at all that crud in there. So you can loosen it up. 
and then you can put it back in the solvent. Now, another thing you can do is get a five gallon bucket and go buy a couple gallons of kerosene because that's what I use for solvent in mine. And you can put the engine block in the kerosene and get a brush, paint brush, and brush it all off. And then you could do your honing that way because uh, kerosene works good for a lubricant if you don't want to use the WD-40. So I'll take it back in my tank and I'll rinse a little bit more through there. You want to clean up all your little valve pockets and stuff too. You can use one of these if you got an air tool. You can get in there. I show you how to do that in the five horse video. Or you can buy these little wire brushes. I remember I got a set of these at the dollar store. It had a, a nylon one and uh, two metal ones. And another thing you can use, but I don't have one, is a toothbrush. <laughs> I don't have a toothbrush. So you can use this little wire brush and let's kind of clean this up a little bit. Get that off of there. And then again, you know, you could do all this, loosen it up, get in there with a Q-tip if you have to, put it back in your five gallon bucket of kerosene, rinse it off some more. You know, it's a lot of back and forth to make sure you get everything. Cause you know, there's a lot of times you miss stuff. You know, you may be cleaning part of it and look in here and go, oh, there's a bunch of crud in here I missed. Let me get in there with a screwdriver and chip that away, depending on how bad the block is. Let me loosen some of that up. Maybe I can get in there with that little brush. Oh, here's some gasket I forgot to get. Maybe I can brush some of that off here. You know, use your head. You know, that's all you gotta do. Hell yeah, look at that. Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Yeah, that tickles, don't it? That tickles, yeah. Okay, it's bath time. Yeah, time for your bath. Here we go. Don't cry, don't cry. Uh, uh, oh, 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 that's a little warm, isn't it? Yeah, that's a little warm, woo. Oh, that feels good, don't it, boy? Yeah, yeah. There you go, there you go. Yeah, there you go, baby. So you're gonna wanna get yourself a five gallon bucket or if you got a wash tub and then put some dish soap in there or if you're brave enough, put in the dishwasher. Your wife won't mind. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't get back to me on that one. Maybe you got an old dishwasher. So you're gonna wanna wash it in some warm, soapy water. Cause that'll get all that kerosene residue and grit and everything off of there. Get yourself a paintbrush or a sponge. Maybe even a rubber ducky. I should have got you a rubber ducky. Put a rubber ducky in there. So that's what you're gonna wanna do. Just before assembly. Cause we got everything clean, we got it honed. Got all our nasty gasket material off. Whee! Whee! Yeah, you like that, don't you boy? Whee! That feels good, yeah! Whee! Yeah, that felt good. Yeah, that felt good. It feels good when you're all clean. Yeah. Isn't learning fun? You know, sometimes people on my staff will alert me to some of the comments and some people just don't get it. I'm trying to make learning fun. Those people that don't like this kind of comedy and stuff that we're doing here is probably the same kid that liked to watch that Air Raid Siren movie in school. Teacher, can we watch that boring Air Raid Siren movie again? That was awesome, where we had to hide under our desk. That was fun. All right, got these locating pins on here. 
Now sometimes you can just grab them with a pair of side cutters and wiggle them out or you may have to drive them out with a punch. Now I did this in the five horse Briggs video too. You get some 150 grit sandpaper or lighter and I got it wrapped around a piece of rubber, quarter inch or three eighths inch rubber that looks like, like a sanding block. And you can kind of lightly sand over the machine surface. And you can kind of see, you know, just like you're doing body work on a car, kind of get it flat. You don't want to do it too much. Just lightly. Then of course this piece would go in the bucket with the soapy water to clean that grit off of there. And then I, you saw me do this with the head where I put a piece of 150 on my bench and then somebody in the Five Horse Briggs video said, you know, use a piece of glass. That's a good idea. If you got a piece of glass, you can put that on there because glass is pretty flat too. So you can stick that sandpaper on a piece of glass. Don't cut yourself. And then with a little circular motion, and then check it, and you'll see your high and low spots, like you say, okay, right there in that corner. So maybe push a little more in that corner a little bit. See how that did it, no, up there in the front. See, we don't want, we just want to check and just make sure that there's no high or low spots. And then of course I should have did this before I washed the baby. Could do it with the block too. Because now there's going to be grit on there. That's alright, give baby another bath. He likes baths. Just to kind of check the deck to see that it's square. This is a little bit of hillbilly machining. It works. Again, just a small engine, not the space shuttle. We're not going to space in it. See, that's nice and flat. That looks good. And then I'll put baby in the bay. You want to take another bath, baby? Yeah, he says yeah. So we'll, we'll wash them again. All right, now, now we're ready for assembly. So blow the holes out real good, all your tapped holes after you get done washing the block. Blow everything out real good, all your tapped holes. Blow everything out. Now we're ready for assembly. I said that before, didn't I? And we weren't ready for assembly. Now we're ready for assembly. Okay, I got the piston in there and I'm test fitting the piston. <laughs> the ham piston. Look at that. That fits in there perfect. That's how you can tell you got a good bore. The hams fits right in that block perfect. Baby shouldn't be drinking hams. Now that we're ready for assembly, we're gonna install the seals. Now on this HS40, the flywheel seal is Three two six hundred. That's the seal for here. And you take a hammer, and you just take a hammer and just as fast and hard as you can just beat it in there. No, that ain't how you do it. Lightly tap on the edge. Try to get it lined up, and then lightly tap around the edge. Now remember this seal was sticking out a little bit. There. Seal's in. It was simple. And then for the cover, we'll do the same thing. Now this had been painted or powder coated and there was a bunch of powder coat in there and I had to clean all that out. But that 
powder coat here in the back here that's not going to hurt anything just make sure that oil hole is clear and for the PTO side 27897 in case you want to know that was that seal same thing trying to get it started and then tap around the outside edge Now this seal we're going to want flush. Beat it in there flush. And then still make sure there's a little gap in there. Because you want oil to accumulate in there and then escape back in there. That kind of helps. Keeping that lubricated. So we want that one flush. So our seals are in. Now our crankshaft. I want to get some of that crocus claw. Where is this? What did I do with that crocus claw? Where is oh here it is. Crocus claw. Like the band crocus. Remember that band? Woo! Throwing horns, crocus. They named it after crocus claw. They, the original name of the band was Crocus Claw. And then they just shortened it to Crocus. Now right now, I got a Crocus song playing in my head while I'm doing this. I'm jamming out. Jamming out to Crocus Claw. We'll polish these up a little bit too if you want. You can find some Crocus Claw. Maybe get a hold of the band Crocus and say, hey, you guys got any old Crocus cloth laying around? Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll send you some. You can maybe autograph the back of that sheet of Crocus cloth. Have all the band members sign it. That Crocus cloth shined it up. Nice. Crocus. Crocus. Almost like a frog croak. Crocus. Crocus cloth. Crocus. So, we want to check what kind of clearance we got. So maybe you don't have all these measuring devices, but you want to make sure that, you know, you got the right clearance on here. So you can go to Auto Parts Store, and you can get what's called Plastic Seal. Now this is 1,000 to 3,000 of an inch clearance range. And then on the other side, I think it's in millimeters, yeah. 0.25 to 0.76 millimeters. This side is in thousandths of an inch. So what plastic gauge is, is just like a little, little thin ribbon, little rod of this like clay-like material. And what you do is you cut a little sliver off Cut a little piece off, then you lay it on the journal. Got to be real delicate. And then you bolt the connecting rod to the crank. And it'll smash that piece of plastic gauge down and then you measure it. See what kind of clearance you got. So you lay it on there sideways like I got there. Use my Terrell shirt as a rag. And I can wash it. Maybe I won't wash it. You don't need to put the, the dipper on there. Be careful. Gotta do it gingerly. 
And then you're gonna torque these to the torque spec. Okay, in our manual it says, here's the models, and here's ours, HS4050, torque to 110 inch pounds. So we got our old school torque wrench, and then you gradually want to tighten each bolt a little bit at a time until you get to 110 inch pounds. Oh. And make sure that the wrench is on the... There, I'm at 80. 80. And then we'll go to 110. We'll go to 100. We'll go to 100. Then I'll go to 110. 110. Hundred and ten. Check this one again. Hundred and ten. All right. Now we'll remove the cap and we'll see what kind of clearance we got. All right, now it's smushed the plastic gauge. So that's when you get this out and you match up the smushness to these. So on this end, it looks like one thousandth of an inch. And on the other end, it looks like one and a half because it looked like it kind of turned when we smushed it. If you know you don't like that the way it's smushed, scrape it off, do it again. But one thousandth to one and a half, it looks like we got. Plastic gauge is telling us what clearance we got. So now you gotta get that off of there. You don't wanna leave that on there. You don't wanna you don't have to use the crocus cloth, it'll come right off. Use my shirt. And clean it off the cap. It's gonna be a little bit in the cap. You could use the cap too, if there's some on there. If it transferred. Usually stays on the journal. Now the connecting rod has a match mark when you put the cap on. You can, you know, the cap will go on either way. This way you can obviously see it doesn't line up right. Well, you know, if you're a knucklehead and don't know, you're gonna do that. Put it on the wrong way. So here's the match mark, see? Right here in this corner. Where your match mark is. So make sure you, when you go to put the cap on, you got the match mark right. And then we're gonna have to put our piston rings on. So we got the piston all cleaned up. Looks good. So in the manual, because the rings came in this box, the new rings, and there was no instructions in there at all. So go in the manual if you got one. But a lot of people don't have manual. And there's a picture, side shot of the rings. Second compression ring, first compression ring, oil ring. Now if you notice, the top ring's got kind of a little bevel on the inside facing up. The second ring they're showing is square, but ours isn't. So it's kind of, I don't know if the camera can pick it up, but this is our compression ring. And there's our bevel. So this is the top ring. It's got the little bevel and that faces up. Now our second ring has got like a little cutout on it. Like, it's almost like an L. And what that does is that, that ring is gonna go down like this that little notch. 
is on the outside that's going to face down. And what that does is that, as the piston's going up and down, that kind of grabs the oil in the cylinder wall and pushes it back down. So if you've got a set of these rings and no instructions, you're trying to figure out which way they go, that's how it goes. This is the second ring, and that's got a little notch. And then the oil ring, you know, that's just a thick ring. That, that's square, so that doesn't matter. That has no up or down. And then you got this little springy thing that goes in the oil ring. So this, this thinner one they sent with us, that's gonna go where that scraper ring was. See, here's our old oil ring. Here's the new one. Here's the part number for those rings. 34854. So they must have changed it. So that goes in there. Now they do have a tool that you can buy that'll spread the piston rings. Just be careful when you put them on. Because you can break them. So just carefully walk them on. Make sure they fit in the groove. And then here's our second one. It's got the little scraper edge on it. So that's got a little helper spring in there too when we go to collapse it. And then here's our compression ring at the top. And that little bevel goes up. I'll make sure there ain't nothing in here. It looked like there are a couple boogers in there I missed. Yeah, a couple boogers on there that I missed. All right, got them boogers cleaned out. Bevel up. There we go. And there's our ring. Now you want to stagger the end gaps. Now there's all different ways of staggering them. I kind of stagger them in, the, in a peace sign shape, like a peace sign. One gap here, one gap here, one gap here. Doesn't matter on the piston where you put it. Just as long as you got them stand, staggered. Some guys may say, oh it does, it matters. I put mine this way. Well you put yours any way you want. This is how I put mine. So now our piston's ready. Right now we got the block. And we'll get our gel lube, or any assembly lube that you want to use. And we're going to want to spray this journal with some gel lube, because it's kind of sticky. Put our crank in. Get it through our seal. There we go. There's our dinner. Okay, now our piston's ready to go in. So, we're gonna lube up the bore with some gel lube. Spray some down on the crank journal. Now, our match mark. We know our match mark is here. So, when you go to put the cap on, you gotta be able to see the match mark. So, that's gonna tell you that the piston goes in like this. Try to give, get, keep it square because as you go to put it in, it might turn on you a little bit. And then we're going to check our rings again. Make sure we got our, our end gaps in the piece symbol or Mercedes Benz symbol. Then you're going to need a piston ring compressor. Place your piston ring compressor on there. Kind of snug it up a little bit. And then I like to push it up a little. And then tighten it. Because sometimes when you do it, you know, if you do it when it's flat, that first ring kind of wants to get stuck. So we're going to lift it up. Make sure we're square. Our piston pin is square. So when we go to drive it in, it's going to 
land on our journal. So I usually take a hammer handle, make sure it's square, and then tap it in. If it sticks on you, then you've got a ring caught. So you may have to do it again. Don't force it. All right, piston's in. So now we can push the piston down with our hand and get it to line up with the journal on the crankshaft. Now you can flip it over. And put the cap on. Now here's our match mark. Put a little more gel lube on there. So we know our match marks here on the outside. Then we gotta put our dipper back on. So we're gonna put our dipper on. Of course the dipper is gonna go on the low bolt because you want it to be in the oil. We took the dipper off when we were doing the plastic gauge. And then you're gonna torque the connecting rod to 110 inch pounds again, just like we did when we checked with the plastic gauge. So you're gonna wanna get them snugged up, and you're gonna go in and torque them. That's why you need a little, a little torque wrench. So I'm going to rotate it a little, give me a little more room with the torque wrench. And we're going to gradually tighten them until we get to that 110. A little bit at a time. To get to 110. Now I'm going to flip it off because it's easier. I had it on its side. So you could see better with the camera. And I'm at 90. Now I'm at 100. Just go back and forth, keep checking it. 100. 110. 110. not moving anymore so we're good you can go back and forth as many times you want just to make sure they're still not moving all right now these don't have any kind of tabs well I guess it does so it's got locking tabs here that you can bend up against the flats of the bolt. See those tabs? And we're gonna bend those up. So you're gonna need a punch. Now some rods don't have any tabs. This motor's old from the 70s. Some of the heads of the bolts lock. So not all of them got locking tabs. So you can rotate it to where you can get at that tab. That's all you need to do. You gotta leave that little bit sticking up in case you have to disassemb disassemble it. You're gonna need the punch to knock that out of the way. So you don't wanna kinda knock that over the top of it. If you want to, you can, but it should be okay. And then you're gonna wanna rotate it. Make sure it's not hitting anything. See, and you'll see our match marks there.
So we know we got that right. So the next thing would be to put the cam in. So here's your lifters. Spray a little gel lube on them. Lifters, tappets, whatever you want to call them. We can call them both. They're not called lifters, they're called tappets. They're not called tappets, they're called lifters. No, they're called black tappets. No, they're called lifters. No, they're called tappets. No, they're called lifters. Well, let's just put these little parts in. We'll spray some gel lube on all the journals. So we got some stickiness on there. And you just gotta find the mark on the cam. A little dot. And right here, we got a little line on ours. Sometimes it's a dot, and here's our dot on the crankshaft. So we just line that up. See, that's all there is to that. Now we can put our gasket on and our cover. Oh, I forgot on the cover. We're gonna hook the governor up on this. See, we still got the governor rod. You know, so many bikes you wanna disable the governor, so you just take it off because you wanna run that thing wide open. But we're gonna put the governor on here. So we gotta put our governor's spool on next. Then we can put our gasket and our, put our cover on. Now, one more thing before we go put that governor spool back on, which I failed to mention after we put the cam in, is we want to rotate it now to make sure nothing's going to hit. We want to make sure we got everything together right. So we want to rotate it around, make sure nothing's going to interfere or hit, and everything's good and everything like that. So here's the cover on this Tecumish. It's got two grooves in it. For two of these here clips. And then we got this washer. There's the washer number, 30590A. And this is the number for the clips. Now I got three here. We only need two. Because when I was going through the parts, I found one. I thought they were all missing. So here's the washer, that goes on first. And then here's our spool. which I should have probably cleaned it up a little bit with our weights on it. So you're gonna to wanna to inspect all the parts, like I said. So you're gonna to wanna to inspect these little rivets. See, you know, if they're war. And this one looks pretty good. So you're gonna to wanna to put that on. And then you notice that's where the first one of those clips go. So this is where you got to be careful because when you're putting this clip on, you don't want it to disappear on you when you go to snap it on there. So I'm going to give me a pair of pliers. I'm going to use this type of pliers. There, now that's on. Now we have to put this spool on. Now this is the part that, that this rubs against for the governor. So when you put this on, the weights gotta go in there like that. See, your little L-shaped part of your weights are down here. And then we put our other clip on the top. So you might want to buy three of them clips because you know what's going to happen, you're going to lose one. 
There we go. So when this thing spins, you know, it's only going to go that far. And the weights are only going to kick out that far. And that's it. You can put a little lube on there, but I mean, once you fill it with oil, the oil is going to get all splashed around there anyway. It's all plastic, so it's not like it's metal on metal. All right, now we can put our gasket on. Here's the part number for the sump gasket, 27677A. And I'm going to use the high tack. I like the high tack gasket sealer. You can use whatever sealer you want on there. You don't have to put any sealer on it, actually. They don't at the factory. But I'm gonna use put the high tack on there. So you just spray it on like spray paint. I think they make this, a couple different companies make it. This is the Loctite brand. High tack. So you spray it on there. You can give it a couple of coats. Let it sit a minute or two. Then I'll flip it over and spray the other side. Okay, I sprayed some more gel lube, or you can use motor oil on these two shafts. The end of the cam and the journal on the crankshaft. Now our gasket's all nice and sticky with that high tack. You know, it kind of holds it in place for you too because it's sticky. Covers all clean, blowed out real good. You know, I inspected the, the bearing surface in here, looked good. You know, if you want to measure all that stuff and compare all the specs in the book, you can do all that, but I can tell by looking at it. It's not all galled up and messed up and then I'll put a little little uh, gel lube on the seal and be careful the lip of the seal you might want to give it a little start with the screwdriver a small screwdriver so you don't roll it. And you may have to turn the crank a little bit to get all the little gears to mesh. See, and then the cover pops right on. So you may have to give it a little turn, a little wiggle. Then we'll go ahead and bolt down our cover. I'm sure there's a torque spec on it, but again, a small engine, ain't the space shuttle. Some of you guys just over technify everything. We're just gonna put the bolts in and tighten them down. We're gonna go in a pattern though, so we tighten it evenly, but we're just gonna tighten it by hand. If you want a, the torque spec, then go find the torque spec. Like I said, it's not that critical, it's just a small engine. Okay, you big babies, I opened the book and got the torque spec. Cylinder cover or flange to cylinder? 65 to 110 inch pounds. So there's a big gap there on what you want. Well, you could torque it at 65, between 65 and 110, because that's what the book says. Guess what I'm torquing it to? I don't, I'm torquing it to this other torque spec called I don't know. Called, I'm tightening it with a wrench until they're tight. And hopefully, when this motor goes to the moon, it's not going to fly apart because I forgot to torque it between 65 and 110. They're tight, just don't go crazy on it. I'm using a quarter inch drive socket wrench. All right, let's see how close I got. Since they're all sitting there crying and whining like a bunch of little babies. Ninety. Hundred. 
So I was close. I was within their specs. I'm gonna go 90. I don't wanna go 110. Might rip the aluminum out. Then you're gonna have to Healy coil it. It's pretty vague in their little manual there. So if you don't have a torque wrench, you're just gonna have to tighten them down. All right, this one was really moving, so we'll go back to it. 90. 90. Then go around and check them all. All right, so now we want to see if we got any kind of end play, which we do. I'm sure there's a spec for that. Okay, I thought that end play that we had was excessive. So I went in the book and looked, and of course it said it should be anywhere between five thousandths and twenty-seven thousandths. So I thought, you know, that's that's more than twenty-seven thousandths. There's probably a thrust washer missing. And sure enough, I went and looked at the parts breakdown, and the thrust washer was missing. Part number three, two, three, two, three. So I put two of them thrust washers in there. I took the cover back off, put two of them thrust washers in there. Now we got very minimum. Uh-oh, money's here. Now we want to rotate it again. Make sure everything's going up and down, even though all we did was put the cover on. Doesn't hurt to do that. Now we're gonna do the valves. Now these valves, they don't look bad. Looks like somebody lapped them. I mean, they're good. They look good. They're not burnt. But I'm going to resurface them anyway on my valve grinding machine. These are at 45 degrees, which is what I got my machine set at, 45. All nice and new again. Nap pretty. I like the way that looks after I resurface them. Now to do the seats in the block, I could use my new way valve seat cutter, but you know, this is a how-to video for the guy at home. And guess what? The guy at home isn't gonna buy one of these new way valve seat cutters. Look it up online, see how much they cost. You'd be very surprised at how expensive this little tool is. For this little bit of stuff, you're looking at about six or seven hundred dollars. Unless you could find a good used one for cheap. So we're gonna show y'all at home how to do it the pterodactyl hillbilly way. I got some 180 emery cloth. And this is my hillbilly valve seat resurfacer. There it is. Hillbilly valve seat resurfacer right there. Put it around the valve. Stick it in. And clean up them seats. Now do the same thing to the other side. All right, we need to set our valve clearance. So you're gonna want the piston top dead center, both valves closed. So you know, you rotate the motor over till your top dead center, both valves closed. And these on the Tecumish are 10 and 10. So since we took some off the face when we ground it in the, in the machine, it, gonna drop it down we're gonna lose some clearance 
So I can feel that we've lost some. But there's probably some clearance in there. So let me go with a 4,000th and see if that'll fit in there. Yeah, it does. It's not tight, but it fits. Let's see on the exhaust. Yeah, I can get 4,000ths in there. So we do have some valve clearance, but we don't have 10. Let's see if we got 10 on the exhaust. No. So you're going to have to grind off the stem. Now you're not going to have a valve grinding machine to do this with. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do it on a bench grinder. Or if you got a wizard wheel, you could do it on that. You might have to clamp your wizard wheel in the vise and have it spinning so you can, you know, go on the side of it and grind some off. And what you want to do is go on the side of the side of the grinding wheel on your grinder and spin it. So you can try to get it as even as possible. You just don't want to go up on the grinding wheel and just grind it like that. You want to go on the side of the grinding wheel and spin it and grind a little off and then you're going to have to come back and check it. So the best thing to do would be, since these are 10 thousandths, use an 8 thousandths feeler gauge. Because that way when you get to 8 thousandths, if you want a little bit more, chances are you're going to be right at 10. But I have a valve grinding machine, so I can grind off the end right here with my machine. check it and if it's I don't have my ten thousandths I keep going back and forth so you're just gonna have to do that with your with your bench grinder or if you got like I said you can clamp a wizard wheel in a vise and do it on the side any way you can grind it Still tight. We got our valve clearance now. Now another thing, you're gonna wanna check the valve guides. You got guides in there, make sure they're not war. So put the valve in and, you know, it's gonna be a little, little wobbly, it has to be. To let oil get through there and you know, it's going to expand and contract. You don't want it to lock up on there. If you have excessive clearance, then you're going to have to take it somewhere and have them bush it. They're going to have to put some kind of brass bushing in there. Now, Briggs & Scranton has a kit for doing that, but are you going to spend the money to buy the kit to have it rebushed? So you'll probably have to take it to a small engine shop and have them put new guides in if they're real sloppy. So that's what you want to check. You want to check your guides. These are fine. It'll work. Again, we're not going to the moon. This isn't going on the shuttle. We have a lift off. So we resurfaced the valves. We set our valve clearance. We checked our valve guides. So now we need to lap the valves in. So you're going to need valve lapping tools and some valve lapping compounds. Put a little bit on the face. Make sure our valve is down in there. Just want to go back and forth. Then I usually pick it up and do this because it kind of helps spread it around. Now I've done them, resurfaced the valve, and then lapped it in, and it was like like a dotted line. And I'm like, okay, I got to take some more off of this valve, and then put it back in my grinder, 
and ground it some more and then it then it lapped in good this one lapped in good got a good good solid line all the way around then I'll I'll take some carb spray on a rag and make sure I wipe all that valve lapping compound off of there when I'm done. So then you do the same to the other side. Lap the other valve in the other side, same way. Okay, we got our valves all lapped in. Now we're going to install them. The springs and the little keeper. So here's your spring. This goes on top of the spring, and this goes on the bottom. Then you're going to need a. A valve spring compression tool. This is a Briggs one. It's got a part number, 19063. You can buy these on the inner screen pretty cheap. And what I like to do is I, because we've got a fight with this top one, I like to put the valve spring in there in an angle to make it easier to line it up with this. And then I want this facing me. So that way when we get it inside there and we get the valve through, when I want to pull it out, I pull the whole thing this way and it kind of locks it in then. And then remember to put some lubricant on the stem of the valve. You want to have a little lube on there. So don't forget to lube up the stem. Now the intake one may take you a few times to get it in there because you got this casting is in the way. So it kind of wants to interfere with putting it on. So the intake, you may have to do it two or three times until you can get it locked on. So here I got the exhaust one ready. See, I got it angled a little bit. Lubed up our valve stem. Gotta be careful. Now I'm just gonna pull this off. I'm gonna yank this out of there. Real quick, see? And it locked it right on. These are a little more difficult, like I said, because it's got that upper cap or washer or whatever you wanna call it. So now we can put our valve cover on. If you want, you can go back and check your valve clearance again, because now you got tension on the springs yep we still got 10 still got a good 10 so remember I told you you got to pop this apart here's our gasket stick it on there and snap that back on now, if you want, you can put the high tack on there, but I don't like putting the high tack on the valve cover gasket, only because, you know, you may have to take this off again, like if you have to do a valve job in the future, and then it's all stuck on there where you can, it'll come off easier. But if you want to high tack it, go ahead. And then it goes like this. See, it won't go in this way, because this thing is gonna hit the spring, so it goes like that. And put your screws in, tighten it down. Then we'll move on to the ignition.